Honourable Members, the President. Members, it's question time. Any questions today? Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Dr Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Planning, uh, it's 98. Uh, I refer to the State Government's approval process for residential land release and ask, one, how many residential lots receive final approval in WA for each of the following financial years, uh, A, 2017-18, B, 2018-19 and C, 2019-20? Uh, two, how many government agencies, entities or entities are involved in the process, approvals process for release of residential land in Western Australia? And three, will the minister table the list of agencies and entities in question two? And if not, why not? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, 1A, 1718, 11,058 residential lots. B, 1819, 10,570 residential lots. C, 1920, 8,856 residential lots. Two to three, the WA Planning Commission is responsible for making recommendations to the Minister for Planning on the zoning of land for residential development. The WAPC also provides applications, also approves applications for residential subdivision. The process for zoning land for residential development and subdivision approval includes consultation with relevant stakeholders and depending on the circumstances, typically includes Environmental Protection Authority, Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, Department of Transport, Main Roads Western Australia, Western Power, Water Corporation, Department of Education, Local Government. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is again to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Planning. Uh, refer to the State Government's approvals process for residential land release and ask what was the average time frame for developer application to final government approval for the creation of residential lots in Western Australia in each of the in each in the financial year, each of the following financial years. Oops. So A 2017-18, B 2018-19, and C 2019-20. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Um, A to C. In general, the WA Planning Commission commission determines freehold survey strata or leasehold survey strata subdivision applications within the 90-day statutory timeframe in the Planning and Development Act 2005. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the issues of hotel of the issue of hotel quarantine staff vaccinations and I ask one, has the Minister received any health advice detailing the efficacy of a single dose of COVID-19 vaccine? If yes, please table. Two, does the current health advice for hotel quarantine staff confirm a single dose is effective in preventing the spread of COVID-19? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, no, the minister has not been provided with formal written health advice. Two, yes, available real-world data indicates that a single dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, AstraZeneca or Pfizer, is effective in reducing spread of COVID-19 among household contacts. Uh, thanks, Madam President. My question without notice, but someone has given this leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to your response to question C081, which did not provide the information requested at the budget estimates hearing on Thursday, the 19th November 2020, and ask one, will you table a memo of the 14th of October 2020, which sought to update Lottery Western Healthways grant making or funding policies and guidelines to align them with the strategic plan, our commitment, supporting equality, diversity and inclusion, and two, if not, why not? The Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. I am advised that an incomplete answer was provided to question without notice 52 yesterday, and I apologise to the House for that. The requested advice is included in the memo, which I now table. One, yes, I table the attached memo, and two, not applicable. That document is tabled. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health. I refer to the government's press statement dated the 14th of December 2020, titled McGowan Government Delivers Funding Boost for Community Services, and specifically the $6 million allocated to the Mental Health Commission for disbursement across eligible contracts. And I ask, will the minister list the service providers who will have their contracts extended to 30 June 2022 by the Mental Health Commission and a breakdown of the funding allocated to each? Minister for Mental Health. Um, Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Donald Farragher for some notice of the question. Uh, the, one, the Mental Health Commission will be notifying the eligible service providers of the 51 service agreements for the once-off funding boost within the next month. 
I do have a list here, Madam President, but I have noticed an error in it. So I'm going to just check that error, and I'll provide something at the end of question time. I'll, pro I'll provide it to you behind the chair and provide it to the, the parliament tomorrow. The Honourable Donna Farragher, on a point of order. For clarification, if I may, you've said behind the chair. Are you intending to table that document? I will table the document tomorrow. Okay. So I'll, I'll happily. The Minister. I will, I will rectify the issue for tomorrow for the chamber. But yes. in the meantime, if I can provide something to you behind the chair, Thank you. I will do that. The Honourable Dick Garan. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to your answer on 5 May 2021 to my question without notice number 35, in which, when asked to table the expert advice received by the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions to validate that a support dog was the best way of dealing with staff stress, you instead tabled a study published in an international journal in 2017 and I ask one, are you aware of a report having been commissioned by the ODPP at a cost of $162,805? Two, why was that report commissioned? Three, when was that report commissioned? Four, why did you not table that report in response to my question? Five, how many recommendations were made in the report? Six, did the report recommend a support dog? And seven, will you now table the report? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. One, yes. Two, the Director General of Public Prosecutions advises that, uh, that the 2015-16 to 2016-17 public sector work for, workforce renewal policy of the Barnett Government to harvest 40 per cent of salaries of departing staff meant the ODPP could only replace prosecutors at a significant lower level of salary and legal skill. This reduced the expertise and number of available prosecutors at the same time the ODPP was experiencing a rapid increase in the complexity and volume of evidentiary uh, material relied upon in prosecutions. The report by Phoenix Australia Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health was commissioned in response to concerns over the mental wellbeing of ODPP staff due to workload pressure and exposure to graphic material. Three, the report was commissioned on the 19th of February 2019 and was delivered on the 29th of July 2019. Four, the Legislative Council question without notice 35 sought uh, advice validating a support dog in relation to staff stress. The Phoenix Australia report did not have a support dog uh, among its recommendations. However, it did cite a further reading on the topic, Dogs in the Workplace, a review of the benefits and potential challenges, published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. The Director of Public Prosecutions advised that this was one study the, D the ODPP considered in detail, and it was duly tabled. 5, 11, 6, please see the answer to 4, 7, given the limited number of staff at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution and personal disclosures in the report in relation to mental health, it is plausible that staff may be identifiable. I ask that the member put the question on notice so these privacy matters can be considered, properly Honourable, considered. Honourable Martin Aldridge. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, or some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to Mr Malcolm McCusker, QC, Professor John Fillimore, Professor Sarah Murray and Associate Professor Martin Drum, the Government appointed members of the Ministerial Expert Committee on Electoral Reform, and I ask one, have any of the aforementioned persons been employed by the Department of Premier and Cabinet as a staff member to a Member of Parliament or as a staff member to a Cabinet Minister? Two, if yes to one, please identify the person the position held, the dates of engagement and the Member of Parliament or Cabinet Minister to whom they were assigned. Three, I note that the terms of reference for the committee provide for resourcing by the Department of Premier and Cabinet. What resources have or will be provided and what is the cost of those resources? And four, is the Department of Premier and Cabinet maintaining a conflict of interest register for the Ministerial Expert Panel? And if so, have any conflicts been declared by committee members to date? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One to two, refer to Legislative Council Table Paper 176. Three, corporate administrative resources will be provided as required. These costs are yet to be determined, however, and will include the remuneration of committee members, advertising and compilation and printing of final report. Four, the Department of Premier and Cabinet is working with the Office of the Minister for Electoral Affairs in supporting the management of any conflicts of interest. The Honourable Colin Ticknell. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which notice is given, is to the regional development manager, uh, manager, I should say, minister. I have had reports that some regional areas have such a shortage of accommodation that the region cannot function, such as road crews not being able to temporarily locate to undertake road maintenance, harvest teams not able to work, regional businesses 
who can find staff but cannot house them, and professionals such as doctors and teachers having to relocate up to one and a half hours away. Although more critical aspects of housing shortage relates to families who are living in cars, couch surfing or in tents, what is the government doing about the strategy to invest in vibrant regional communities that facilitate investment and community growth so that houses do become available, given huge iron ore royalty-driven surpluses? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question. And member, um, of course, we acknowledge that um, given the way in which our, our economy um, has grown uh, in the uh, in the last uh, year to six months uh, to a year, uh, we certainly are now seeing housing stress. And I think uh, you would have heard the numbers read out by the leader of uh, the House earlier uh, about the low level of building approvals that had occurred for a number of years. So the key thing is obviously to get more houses into uh, the market. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that we are seeing um, a real acceleration in many country areas. And just looking at your electorate, for example, in the city of Albany in the last six months, we've seen, compared to the previous six months, a 200% a increase. Um, gone from 72 to um, uh, 219. Uh, we've seen Bustleton's gone from 166 to 362, uh, and Bunbury from 59 to uh, uh, 85. So we really are seeing um, some boom things happening, uh, and we're out there with our stimulus package, which obviously our $440 million uh, stimulus package, which uh, includes lots of incentives for uh, people to, uh, to build. We've also got a $166 million regional land booster package. So this is um, making uh, land available both for industrial, uh, well, for industrial, commercial and residential in regional areas um, uh, so that we're not necessarily getting full uh, market recovery. So we're um, um, see uh, from the consolidated account funding uh, development WA to do that. And we're seeing places like in the Pilbara, we're seeing uh, more land sales, vacant land sales occur because we've been able to bring the land prices down with that 166 million. So we're um, really seeing land price, uh, land sales uh, increase. We've got a $200 million Northwest Aboriginal Housing Fund. Um, in um, places like Exmouth and Kalbarri, we've committed uh, to making land available, and I understand my good friend, the Honourable Carl McGinn, will be following up our election commitment in, um, in Exmouth um, to make land available for uh, special housing uh, for worker accommodation, and we're looking at how we can replicate that in towns like um, uh, Shark Bay. We have a massive uh, targeted maintenance program for regional, social and remote um, government housing projects, and I'm told um, that around 200 homes in the Great Southern, for example, are going to be um, um, upgraded as, uh, as part of that. And we have 97 million to build new uh, social housing in um, in regional uh, Western Australia. So there is uh, 141 million to refurbish um, social housing. So uh, there is a great deal of money that has been put in to stimulate uh, housing, the production of new houses, to um, uh, have more land released. Uh, and at, a, at a, uh, a cheaper price and to really invest heavily into social housing. Alison Simon. Oh, thank you, Madam um, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Commerce. One, is any specific data being collected to assess the impact of the end of the rent increase and eviction moratorium? Two, if yes, A, what data is being collected? B, who is collecting it? C, would the Minister please advise any findings? And three, if no to one, why not? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the member for the question, and the following information has been provided by the Minister for Commerce. One, yes. Two, yes. 
A. The Department of Mines Industry Regulation DMIRS, uh, collects data regarding bond lodgements and disposals, contact call centres, residential tenancy, uh, mandatory conciliation disputes, residential rent relief grants and complaints regarding alleged breaches of the Residential Tenancies Act 1987. B. DMIRS, Consumer Protection Division. C. The information is provided to the Minister on an ongoing basis as part of an advice of programs and initiatives. This could not be described as findings. The member is encouraged to be specific in her request for data. Three, not applicable. The Honourable Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Environment. I refer to clearing by the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attraction on the edge of block FRK406 in the Walpole Nornlup National Park for prescribed burns in 21 and 22. And I ask, one, what is the plan to protect Douglas Hill 407, which is an extremely valuable research block, from being inadvertently burnt, particularly given the last time a burn was completed in the area, the fire jumped into a small part of 407 below Sappers Bridge? Thanks very much, Madam President. I, of course, provide this answer as the Minister representing the Minister for Environment because she indeed is in the other place. One, the reference to Block FRK 406 is not consistent with the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, DBCA current naming nomenclature, and would require an archive search to confirm the location referred to. Therefore, DBCA is unable to provide a specific response to this question in the time frame available. During the planning of prescribed burns, a range of strategies are identified to reduce the likelihood of any potential escapes. These strategies include, but are not limited to, upgrading and maintaining burn boundaries, selecting appropriate weather and fuel moisture conditions, and identifying required resources. Thanks, Madam President. My question, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Commerce. I refer to the $100 million land tax assistance package for commercial landlords and the $30 million announcement for residential tenants grants, both announced last year, I ask one. Regarding the land tax assistance package for commercial landlords, A, how many applications and what is the total dollar value of applications received on, from landlords to date? B, how many grant payments and what is the total value of those payments to successful applicants to date? Two, regarding the residential tenancy grants, a. How many applications and what is the total dollar value of applications received from tenants to date? And B. How many grant payments and what is the total value of those payments to successful applicants to date? Uh, I thank the um, member for the question and uh, the answer has been provided by the Minister for Commerce. One, uh, this part of the question um, should be referred to the Minister for Small Business. Two, uh, regarding the residential relief grant scheme, A, as of 12 May 2021, 15,871 uh, applications have been received. It's not possible to calculate the total value of the applications received. B, as of 12 May 2021, a total of $11,142,220 has been paid to 7,993 uh, uh, 7, applicants with an additional, and it's got uh, 4,945 awaiting payment to a further five applicants. There are 2,482 applicants pending, applications pending finalisation for processing. Grant applications remain open. The Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Health. When the Government announced the MRI in April of 2019, it was estimated that the construction of the MRI suite would take 30 months to complete. I note that the Minister's 30-month time frame is due to expire in October this year, and I ask, one, can the people of the goldfields expect to be able to access the MRI services from October? Two, if not, why not? And three, how much longer will the minister make the people of the goldfields wait for this vital piece of medical equipment? 
Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notes to the question. One, the MRI suite is expected to be operational by the third quarter of 2021. Two to three, not applicable. The honourable Yawn Sidmar. My question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the parliamentary secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to the Minister's hand-picked expert committee on electoral reform, and I ask one. Since the election, on how many occasions and via what means has the Minister or his office communicated with each of the four members of the committee up to and including the 30th of April 2021? Two, what was the substance of those communications? And three, will the Minister table those communications? And if not, why not? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question, uh, and I provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One to three, the Minister met with the committee members on the 1st and 8th of April 2021 and has had telephone discussions with each of them. He initially sought their availability in relation to the review and subsequently consulted them in relation to the terms of reference. The Minister also wrote to the committee members on the 28th of April 2021 to confirm their appointment. I tabled the letters of appointment. Those documents are tabled. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the Minister for Transport's admission that the $1.86 billion forest for the airport link will not become operational until the first half of 2022, 18 months after its original scheduled completion date of December 2020. And I ask one, what are the financial contingencies applied to contracts under the umbrella of the forest for the airport link? Two, how are the, how are the values of these the contractual contingencies calculated and applied? Three, what is the value of the insurance policy covering the construction and delivery of the forest for the airport link? Four, with which company or entity is the insurance policy held? And five, what does the policy specifically cover in relation to the construction and delivery of the Forestville Airport Link? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to five, the project cost model, including an allocation for contingency, was determined as part of the project definition plan under the former government in 2014. It is noted that the opposition has refused to approve the release of this document to the government. There are a number of insurance companies involved, including the lead insurer at Zurich Insurance. The policy applies to the construction works value of the entire project. Honourable Alison Zamon. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to my question on notice number 3366, asked on the 3rd of November 2020, for which I have yet to receive an answer, and I ask one. Will the Attorney General please advise which statutory reviews of legislation within uh, his portfolios are currently outstanding? Two, on what date were each of these reviews due? And three, if no to one, why not? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. One to do, I table the attached um, paper and seek leave for it to be incorporated into Hansard. The so it's in document. A ta sorry, it's a table. Sorry, Madam President. That document is. Do you want to just table it, or do you want to seek leave to incorporate it? I think it, it should be incorporated into Hansard. The as well. Parliamentary Secretary seeks leave to incorporate that document into Hansard. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Uh, Three, not applicable. Honourable Colin de Cousin. Thanks, Madam President. My question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the issue of hotel quarantine staff being banned from working second jobs, and I ask one, which agency holds the contracts with companies undertaking hotel quarantine work? Two, which agency is responsible for implementing the signing of statutory declarations by hotel quarantine staff? Three, at what stage in their employment at hotel quarantine sites are staff required to sign the statutory declaration? And four, what monitoring and reporting processes are in place to ensure hotel quarantine staff are not working second jobs? Thanks very much, Madam President. Um, you can give it if you want to. You can give it if you want to. That's, that's ambition, Minister. That's ambition. I don't need it. I'm trying to take my job. Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, the Department of Health holds contracts in relation to security and transport services. Two, none. Three, a statutory declaration within seven days of commencing employment and a declaration at each pay cycle thereafter. Four, the Department of Health receives a statutory declaration from each hotel with each invoice, declaring a copy of individual statutory declarations and updated declarations at each pay cycle have been received. The Honourable Yawn Sidma. <laughs> thank, you much. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice uh, has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. 
I refer to my question of 5 May concerning allegations of systemic waste levy avoidance being brought to the attention of the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation over the course of the last four years, which I was asked to put on notice due to the level of detail required to answer, so I ask a more specific question. One, is the Minister aware of the substance of a submission made by the Waste and Recycling Industry of Western Australia, WRIWA, particularly the following? WRIWA has provided evidence to the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation and to the Minister for the Environment that levy avoidance in the C and D sector here in WA is large-scale, systemic, organised and long-standing. Two, if yes, what actions, if any, have been undertaken by the ministers and or the department in recent years in relation to this allegation? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, yes. Two, the information provided has been the subject of ongoing investigations to determine if it can be corroborated with admissible evidence to prove that offences have been committed. While some of the information submitted was unable to be substantiated, it provided additional lines of inquiry and further intelligence for investigators. In order to initiate a prosecution, the admissible evidence must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the particular offences have been commissioned. Securing evidence to the standards expected by the courts remains the, active, sorry, remains the subject of active joint investigations. Honourable Martin Aldridge. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, is, is to my favourite parliamentary secretary, to the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to policies and procedures applied by the WA Electoral Commission in relation to employees, whether casual or permanent, in relation to political neutrality, and I ask one. Please table any relevant document, procedure, guideline or instruction in relation to the expectation of employees and political neutrality. Two, can a person be engaged by the Commission if previously employed by a member of parliament, a cabinet minister, or who is or has previously been a member of a political party? Three, please table all correspondence between the Commission and any other person in relation to the formation or operation of the Ministerial Expert Committee on Electoral Reform. And four, does the Electoral Commissioner consider the extraordinarily short period of time for public submissions as suitable, given the significant complex nature of the review. Parliamentary Secretary to the, to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and uh, I thank the, my fourth favourite National Party member for the, some notice of, of the question. Our answers one to two. The employees of the West Australian Electoral Commission are expected to complete Form 1 declaration by officer and comply with the Commission's Code of Conduct concerning declarations of conflict of interest. I table a copy of both documents. Three to four, the West Australian Electoral Commission was not involved in the formulation, formation or appointment of the Ministerial Expert Committee on Electoral Reform, nor its ongoing operation. Those documents are tabled. The Hon. Diane Evers. Madam President, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Forestry. I refer to the recent arbitration case regarding payments to share farmers and the Forest Products Commission. I ask what was the outcome? What does the FPC propose to do as a result of the case, and when will this occur? Three, will all share farmer payments be recalculated as a result? Four, if yes to three, what is the time frame for this to occur? Five, if no to three, why not? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question, and I also I commend uh, generally the uh, member for her interest in share farming and the potential that that might have generally for the agricultural sector. Um, uh, the, Ministry for the Minister for Forestry has provided the following answer. One, arbitration proceedings were completed in December 2020 between the FPC and in an individual share farmer, pursuant to the Commercial Arbitration Act 2000. And 12 details of the arbitration are confidential information too. The FPC is in the process of independently auditing the share farmer payments. Three to five. The share farm arrange agreement under the arbitration has unique terms. The FPC is confident that other share farmer payments have been correctly calculated. The Honourable Nick Graham. President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Child Protection. I refer to the Government's commitment to establish teen crisis accommodation in the northern suburbs, and I ask one, how many young people will be able to stay at the accommodation facility at any one time, and two, in which calendar month is the teen accommodation scheduled to be operational? 
Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, uh, thank you Madam President. I thank the member for some notice of this question. The $3.4 million for crisis accommodation for teenagers in Perth's northern suburbs was announced by the Premier on 6 January 2021 as part of a new $58.6 million package to support at-risk youth. One, six, two, the government will work with Youth Futures to deliver this service. An announcement on the development and opening of the new facility will be made in due course. Leader of the House. The business of the House be resumed. Business of the House is now resumed. Are there any further answers? The Minister for Mental Health. Madam President, earlier in question time, the Honourable Donna Farrago, who's away from the Chamber on Urgent Parliamentary Business, asked me a question as Minister for Mental Health. I wasn't in a position to table a list of the service prov providers at that stage, uh, but I now table that list. That document is tabled. Are there any further answers from any minister or parliamentary secretary? If not, members, we now return to orders of the day.